Fasten your seatbelts. The foremost authority on 9-11. The best-selling author of Methodical Illusion and a researcher extraordinaire. Rebecca Roth is about to step up to the microphone and launch into Reality Check, where the light will shine brightly upon the truth. Live from Mesquite, Nevada, it's the Rebecca Roth Show, starring Rebecca Roth. And I'm your host, Ramjet. Relaxed Ramjet. <laughs> well, Mesquite, that just sounds like barbecue to me. <laughs> Oh, I don't even want to know. I don't what, know is there anything Mesquite, going there? It sounds like a place you'd eat barbecue. <laughs> I, I don't know that Mesquite, Nevada is large enough to even have a barbecue restaurant. But well, it has some pretty good golf courses. All right. Okay. Well, that's probably what you're up to, huh? Okay. So, well, welcome to the Rebecca Roth Show. So, so glad you could figure out a way to make it all happen. Uh, it's kind of crazy, I know, sometimes with schedules and, and the like and all the electronics that we go and deal with. Um so here, let's see. First off, let's get a re get let's get over the business first. Um, I am going to keep the membership in my uh, fan club membership. Larry, what do you want to call it? Membership uh, website. Um, I'm going to extend the thirty percent discount, so you can go in and get a thirty percent discount if you check the box and have a recurring every week. Uh, three months, six months, or twelve months, you'll get charged that same amount. So if you sign in for a year, that's going to be it until you leave. Um, but we can save you some money now. I mean, are the initial expenses really, you know, kind of are taken care of. So uh, I'm able to uh, make it more affordable and I'm all for it. Uh, speaking of affordable, <laughs> yeah, as a member of Behind the Galley Curtain, you also get a, a letter uh, welcoming you in. Check your spam box if you sign up because it probably goes in there because it comes through, you know, WordPress or something. It's some automatic uh, launcher it'll say welcome you know welcome aboard or something and you get a 15 percent discount in the online bookstore on on top of whatever is going on right now we have uh, the uh, a kind of a cool holiday special in our online bookstore you can go any of the uh, web pages for any of the four books methodical illusion methodical deception blah 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 dot com you can click on autograph books and um click on and you can go in it's a square store so they process all your credit card stuff and then they send the publisher an in uh, a letter that says this person wants to buy this so we've taken if you really want a get great idea for a gift for uh, someone friend or family that you don't want to talk to about 9-11 just want to give them a gift uh, these books come with uh, the laminated bookmarks uh, vinyl window stickers and you know little nice little things like that and uh the uh, first book in the series is, is for the holiday. And this is going to go through now all the month of December, which I guess we're just starting. And it, this sale will end the uh, 1st of January. And that book is only $13 in the U.S. That's complete with tax license and, uh, <laughs> and shipping. So if you're uh, outside of the United States, that includes Canada, you can just email. And in the store, if you scroll down to the bottom, all the email information for the publisher, you can just email him and they pay with PayPal through that also. And tell him where you are in Canada and what you want, if it's one book or the sets. And then he'll figure out the postage for you and then just add that. We just, Square doesn't do it. And I know why. It's very complicated. I've already heard this from him a few times. Also, in the part of the Christmas specials, and this is right at the top of the store, right by where you see Santa Claus, uh, is a four-book special in soft back. So if you haven't read the series or would like to give it away as a gift, it comes with a free copy of The Christmas Circle. So you have that for your, and that'll just be autographed. Uh, those will, usually I personalize them to whoever's purchasing them, except I don't personalize the Christmas book. You might get it and say, hey, this is a great gift. I'm going to give it away. So I don't personalize it to you. Uh, it's also, there's a hardback set for $99 with the free book of Christmas book. And then uh, there's the Christmas circle itself has been reduced down to $19. And uh, then you can, they can go in and you can buy the rest of the stuff that's in the store. You can scroll all the way through the store. There you go. That's our Christmas special. And that's going to be, I, I think $13 is a great idea of a gift idea or a stocking stuff if you got those big stockings um, to put a methodical illusion and they'll get a bookmark that shows the rest of the series and uh, connects them to all the web pages and stuff. 
Uh, and then that really, that book is really an eye opener. And I think the reason I recently did an interview with BBC and, and I was asked, why did you do this as novels? And I think it's easier if you read this, it's like watching a movie and, you know, in comparison, I had actually just gotten into this thing where I was watching a bunch of old James Bond movies. I know you're a fan of them too, aren't you, Ramjet? Um, so I, I honestly remember that James Bond uh, movie or books were written by Ian Fleming, who eventually we found out was MI6. So, you know, whether how much of that is real and ju and just blown up is <laughs> either here or there. Or there, but you can watch a James Bond movie. As a matter of fact, when I was telling this um, uh, guy from the BBC that was interviewing. Uh, you know, the story and the things that I'd uncovered. He says, oh, so this is starting to sound like a James Bond movie. <laughs> so when you were done with the BBC interview, was the guy shaken, not stirred? <laughs> well, I'm not quite sure. Um, you know, I'm a, um, I am like to teach uh, people about the things that I've learned. And one of the things I've really learned about is how controlled all of the media is, including BBC. And now I think anybody that's... Um, that's been around the whole 9-11 conspiracy stuff and, and what happened and watched that day. We all remember uh, Jane Stanley, who was standing there somewhere uh, high up, uh, overlooking Building 7, telling us that the Solomon Building had collapsed. And it hadn't. It was standing be behind her still. And so I'm like, uh, okay, well, Operation Mockingbird's still in effect. And um, one of the things that I really wanted to do was to be able to write these in um, fiction form so that people could really believe, let it sink in. Let it just, it's easier to believe a novel or a movie, I think, than reading a nonfiction, which I'm working on now. Uh, I'm, and I'm going to try to make the nonfiction as, as fun to read as possible because, I, I mean, I just can't print out radar and text and make it be interesting so it's got to it's going to be more interesting than than just looking at stuff like that i mean there's there's a lot of data in the freedom of information act data that nobody would ever be able to understand what it was so i'm not going to give it i'm not going to put that in there i'll put some things in there from it though um but i'm working on the outline now to uh, get that put together and uh, also in all the web pages there's a, a little place where you can click on and go and get a newsletter. I don't do out I do newsletters, but I will when I, you know, I'm going to launch this book or I've got a pre-sale going on, stuff like that. So you can go in there. I'm not going to send you an email once a week and give you stock or ask you to buy bitcoins or, or vitamins or anything like that. I just like, you know, if you want to stay in touch, uh, it's kind of a cool thing. I just did that when the uh, new um, websites were uh, reworked for all the books. And, um, so there, you know, when I get a new book coming out and I have an idea when it's going to be available or put on a pre-sale or show up in the store, I'll I'll do that um, for you. And I am working on book five in the novel series because there is more to this story. I I thought it was over with the first book, but uh, the the first book is going to guarantee to wake somebody up. And as long as it takes you out of the picture, you don't you know they can come and say, "Wow, I really like that book," or then come out and say, "Oh, I didn't like that book at all," or "That book was really weird." Um, but you're not involved with it. No matter how much about nine eleven you think you thought you knew, let Vera Hansen, the protagonist in the story, lead your friend or family member uh, for you know give them the truth for Christmas this year. And, uh, you know, let them digest some of that stuff. And it's really important. And that's what I want to talk about today. So one of the things that I did for the fourth book was because I, I, I found with each book that came out that um, my fans and readers that, um, you know, would follow or people that would contact me after, you know, Coast to Coast AM interview or something, um, and even George Norrie and Coast to Coast AM has a has a hard time believing that the CIA was involved in this. And so what I did in the fourth book really was a kind of a deep dive. I'm still down there actually into the, the CIA and their history and what they did, what they've done. So why is it so hard for people to understand uh, the, the, uh, the CIA? And I think a lot of us think that the CIA is some government agency to keep us safe. It's like they think it's like the FDA, but I just saw a television show that's got some pharmaceuticals that almost everybody in this country takes for high blood pressure, uh, having uh, 
uh, carcinogens from some Chinese manufacturer in it. Um, and you know, how many years has that been going on that you've been taking a high blood pressure medication that's got a carcinogen because it's got, it's con contaminated with something that causes cancer. And these are pills coming out of uh, China. How long has the FDA known about that? They didn't say that in the story, but I don't take medication and that's one reason why. So, you know, it's that kind of stuff that we, I think there's a, there's a part of us. I think the younger people are a little smarter than this, but now we grew up thinking that the FDA and the DEA and the CIA and the FBI, that they were all above board and they were there to help us and protect us and keep America safe, America. But that's not necessarily the history of a lot of those government agencies, in particular, the CIA and the FBI. And so while doing this research for the fourth book and the um, fictional uh, hearings, uh, the 9-11 hearings that came up, the new one, the one that's going to really bring out the truth, uh, I brought out a lot of the history of the CIA. And so there's all of these things I find in common. So you guys know, if you've heard me before, I see patterns <laughs> and I'm a puzzle person. And so I see things that are the same. All If I see the same recipe being used all the time, it's just like what you see in front of a a, a presidential or a, a midterm election. You often see one side, I don't need to tell you who they are, constantly attacking someone personally as being a racist or a um, womanizer or something like that. You see it over and over again. You start, when you live long enough, you start to see these things line up and this is a pattern. This is going to happen again two years from now. Okay. So with 9-11, once I put the pieces of the puzzle together uh, I, and doing this research, I started to see all these patterns uh, and I think you've done, uh, I've, you've read some of my uh, reading books, uh, <laughs> Justin's, right, Mary Jet, you in your travels? You make me read all of your books. <laughs> I don't have a choice. Okay, so, so you kind of got into this where some people, I know this is a hurdle for some people. How, how can you believe that the government would do that? And I can't believe the government would be a part of this. You know, it's like, wait a minute. I, I think, do you know what the government's been a part of? I think the people that uh, really have a hard time with 9-11 are, are really married to that scenario that they can't move away from the fact that our government would do anything that's not uh, pure as mother's milk. And as a result, they can't digest what's going on with 9-11 or any of the other horrible things that people like the CIA or organizations like the CIA have done over the years. Yeah. Well, you know, and this is what I, I kind of delivered through this uh, hearings that are in book four is the history of these things that have happened. And when you look at them, especially if you look through the history of the CIA, and there's lots of books out there about, you know, different uh, things. I read a gazillion books on, on this to get some some aspects of history that I wanted to put in that fourth book because they line up with 9-11. Well, you know, one of the things I, you probably didn't do in the fourth book, I know you really exposed the CIA pretty heavily, but you didn't talk about specifically the role that the FBI plays in covering up all the things that the CIA does. Now, if you look at your books and the things that you've said uh, over the years, uh, you get the flavor of that. You get an understanding that the FBI really is the uh, garbage man of the CIA. They clean up the mess. But, uh, you know, I really lately, per, you know, particularly as I look at the FBI and their history and what they've done uh, and what they're doing presently, I really realize that they truly are a corrupt organization. Now, that doesn't mean that every single person in there is but the directions that they get from the top down for years, for starting with J. Edgar Hoover, basically have been corrupt. Yeah, well, that's very true. And the, how they work together is kind of fascinating, too. So I tried to bring a lot of that kind of stuff to the surface. Oh, by the way, in case I forget, I'm going to say this right now and interrupt myself with this uh, thought. For those of you who are listening that are members at Behind the Galley Curtain, or those of you who are interested to go a little deeper 
into 9-11. There's a bunch of videos already there. But for the uh, week or so between Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, uh, I'm going to be uh, doing a bunch of stuff. Uh, we've got uh, both of us have kids, travel, grandkids. Uh, and I'm going to try to, you know, do a new uh, introduction kind of thing and do some new artwork for the 2019 you can believe it 2019 that sounds so so sci-fi um but so there's going to be a lot of stuff in, in the interim what we're going to do instead of a daily show and behind the galley curtain i'm going to do an in-depth dive into 9 11 and i'm going to take from the very get-go and i'm going to post all those in there and there'll you know be probably 10 of them and so there won't be a daily show. I'll put something, a little note up there too. But we're going to go into really explaining some things. So if you're listening uh, and you have questions still, or if you've read the books um, and you, you know, if there's something you want to know, you can either email me. There's every page has a contact form. You can look eventually get to me. Uh, and you can ask a question there. I will try to address it. Uh, you know, so far, what I want to do is really be able to explain how each book came up about and how things were discovered and make that a really kind of an in-depth, more in-depth than the books are. And it's just going to be uh, in lieu of, so that I can have those uh, already and it'll free us up to have a little bit of uh, free time but at the same time, give you some something interesting to listen to every day. Because I know a lot of my uh, the members in the um, behind the galley curtain aren't aren't watching the news anymore. So, and there's a good reason for that because it's Operation Mockingbird. So one of the things I found that's interesting, back to what I wanted to chit chat about, is that all of the uh, involvements that we see over our history, the John F. Kennedy assassination. Um, the Gulf of Tonkin, uh, the Martin Luther King, Malcolm X uh, assassinations, Robert Kennedy's assassination, the Oklahoma City bombings. Um, boy, there's so much stuff. And 9-11. That's, that's a lot of those things, right? TWA 800 is also. There's all of these things that are exactly the same. It's a pattern that's followed with each each thing. And as I've gone through and I've read several books now on, on all of the, these uh, those subjects at the time of the John F. Kennedy assassination uh, the top people this would be uh, from Lyndon Johnson to his NSA guy um, and and down you know and to the media the media would say anything they were told to say this is Operation Mockingbird and it's still highly in effect uh, they were quick to dispel the conspiracy involvement. They wanted to put the blame on Castro's Cuba for the assassination. They even tried to blame uh, Robert Kennedy because uh, they needed to put the blame somewhere other than where it really should have gone to, which is the CIA and the mafia and the Mossad and the FBI. You know, those, all of these people involved. And so all of these things I see that happened, the FBI changed the initial 302s or the initial interviews of all of the eyewitnesses and the people that were there that saw someone other than Lee Harvey Oswald, for example. And uh, they harassed them. Now, I've talked to crew members from uh, Delta 1989 that landed in Cleveland guess who harassed them and that all they did was they just landed because the FAA, FAA told them they had a hijacker on board when they said they didn't because they were just in the middle of their meal service they said well you got a bomb on board land the plane so those uh, crew members were harassed uh, for years by the FBI they weren't they didn't do anything wrong they were just for her harassed I don't know if the passengers I haven't heard from any of them yet um, but much like uh, with the Patriot Act that followed 9-11, we see uh, Johnson, uh, Lyndon Johnson, LBJ, he was called, had changed uh, the national uh, security uh, action memorandum. It's called the NSAM, uh, National Security Action Memorandum. He changed Kennedy's, and that was our United States involvement in the Vietnam War. And guess when that was written? The day before the assassination by the head of the National Security. 
who was the head of the national security for both Kennedy and Johnson. He, by the way, went on a couple of two, three years later and went and ran the Ford Foundation. And one of the things I'm finding is that uh, Rockefeller, uh, uh, Ford Foundation, there's a lots of them. There's uh, gazillions of these foundations that are uh, funded by the CIA. And for various reasons, it's really quite fascinating. Uh, the witnesses who saw two men, not uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, in the Kennedy assassination, and the witnesses that saw the guys over at the Grassy Knoll, the witnesses that picked up multiple bullets. Remember, we were told there was only one bullet, one magic bullet that did all the damage that it did. Uh, so it's interesting when you look at this, that like 9-11 with the Patriot Act that was being written before 9-11 happened. I mean, it was, that popped out really quickly. Uh, you got the same kind of stuff going on. Uh, same kind of harassment. Eyewitnesses that have their, their 302s or their FBI interview completely changed. And here's another thing I found really interesting, because this is with every one of these things. TWA 800, numerous people saw uh, missiles or what they thought at first were flares being shot from a boat. But um, what's fascinating on this one is uh, uh, John F. Kennedy's press secretary, Pierre Salinger, came out uh, publicly and said, oh, no, I, I'm pretty sure this was a missile uh, mistakenly or accidentally fired from a United States Navy vessel. Well, probably was. Uh, was it a mistake or not? We don't know. But the mainstream media took this guy on and all of a sudden called him a conspiracy nut for even suggesting friendly fire could have taken TWA 800 down. They discredited him. They called him an idiot. They really ripped into him. And he had been the press secretary for John F. Kennedy. I mean, he was a highly respected uh, journalist and, and just a person. Same kind of stuff happened with Oklahoma City bombing, the FBI was seen by eyewitnesses removing the cameras. Remember the 85 plus cameras around the Pentagon that are now still sealed so you can't see the missile that hit it? Same kind of stuff went on in the Oklahoma City. They harassed the eyewitnesses or anybody that came out. This is the same with the TWA 800, Oklahoma City bombing, the John F. Kennedy assassination, I mean, and 9-11, if you saw an airplane that didn't look like a commercial aircraft and you said that, that tape has been disappeared and probably you have too. Well, I think really what's going on is that the FBI's role in all of this is to mold the story to fit exactly what they want. And if you are, you know, uh, not in line with that particular story, they're going to harass you and badger you until you finally are in compliance with what it is that they have as the story. And if you look at, uh, you know, the, the basic story of 9-11, you know, they have harassed people to the point where they just finally give up and say, yeah, I didn't see that what I actually saw. I saw what you're telling me I saw. Well, exactly. And this is another thing I've seen in, in, in studying through each one of these events in our history is that they're told by usually an FBI agent or a government agent, but it's usually an FBI agent. They were literally told to shut up and they were told what they were to say they saw. And if they weren't, they would be dead. In often many cases, there were many, and this just shocked me to read this because I, you know, I remember where I was when Kennedy got shot. Um, but I, there's a lot of this stuff. I just had no idea. I didn't know about George Morinschled and the FBI and the CIA connection, uh, to all of these people involved. Um, but yeah, it's just, uh, fascinating that they've gone and followed the same recipe. And they do that because they control the media. So they control the message. And another thing is as crazy as some of this stuff sounds, for instance, they, um, after the Kennedy assassination from the book depository window, uh, they actually moved a street sign. Uh, so they changed, they changed the street sign right away because to make that shot would have been impossible for 
uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and the rifle that he used. And so all of the details, uh, but people who really saw stuff and people that really knew stuff about him uh, and the truth about him uh, were ignored in the Warren Commission. And the, uh, all of the investigation that they did just like Building 7 was ignored. And so that's what happened also with everybody else. I mean, the, the uh, Martin Luther King, they did the same thing. They've got a patsy. Uh, they usually have the patsy picked out. Oklahoma City, the same kind of thing. Uh, they've got a patsy uh, picked out. Uh, there's no fingerprints on anything. He has an alias. All of these people have an alias. The same thing happened with Mohammed Atta on 9-11. Some of those guys never have been, uh, that have been accused of being the hijackers on 9-11. They were, they've never stepped foot into the United States, but our government will never change history. That those people will go down in history until the truth comes out. And I don't know that it ever will until Jesus comes back. <laughs> really. I don't know that there's a government agency that can bring the truth out because like I say in book four, what would happen if the truth came out that the, there were no 19 Arabs on board. And then what does that mean? That this was just like um, Operation Northwoods, only on steroids. We did it a little bit better. And an interesting thing about Operation Northwoods, too, uh, Operation Northwoods was a, a designed plan, came out of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, presented to John F. Kennedy. And in, uh, in order to get the American people revved up to go to war with Cuba, Castro's Cuba, because it became communist and they, he was the big enemy. He was the ISIS of his day. We'll say it that way. He was the Osama bin Laden of the 60s. Okay, so you now you kind of understand what's going on. So everything that happened uh, or was going to happen with this Operation uh, Northwoods was going to be blamed on Castro's Cuba and the communists. Now, what were they going to do? They were going to fake hijackings of commercial airlines. They were going to uh, set bombs and assassinate people on U.S. soil. And they were every bit of terrorism that our own government, CIA, was going to do would be then blamed on Castro's Cuban uh, communists, CCCs. So after, I mean, the, the CIA really messed up really, really bad. And looking back now, here it is in the year, whew, almost 2019. But looking back now, there was a guy called General uh, Edward Lansdale. He was the CIA's master psyops guy, the psychological operations guy. Check this out. After the Bay of Pigs failure, and that failed because there were British spies that were double agents to Moscow. Uh, yeah, there's a, there was a spy ring. There's, I think there were five of them, uh, British MI6 guys who were also uh, working for, uh, the Russians. So the double agents and they let, uh, the Cubans know that the Bay of Pigs operation was going to happen when it was. And that's why it was a, such a failure. So the CIA has egg on their face, right? But this general Edward Lansdale, who's the psych psychological operations guy, psyops, you'll hear it all the time. If you're paying attention, psychological operations, that's what operation mockingbird ba basically is. It's telling you basically manipulating how you think about an event in history or a group of people even. Um, so, or, or a person. So he had a plan. This is crazy, Ramjet. He had a plan. I bet you don't know about this because I just recently uncovered this one. I thought I thought I'd read a lot of stuff about this, but he had a plan to park a submarine off the coast of Cuba and project images or an illusion of Jesus Christ being up over the water off the coast. I don't know what he thought the Cuban people were going to do? Were they going to lie down and think this was the rapture? I, that part of the story wasn't put in here. <laughs> but looking back now from the nearly the year 2019 and all the technology we have and the hologram technology that's been around since the mid 80s that you could photograph even, you can see that the, the CIA, this guy was the CIA psychological operations guy. He was going to basically lay up a hologram of Jesus Christ 
in front of the Cuban people. I don't. I honestly don't know if he was going to scare them or what they thought they were going to lay down. I don't know what the end of. I'll have to figure that out. I've got to look this guy up and find the ending to that story. What was he thinking? But look at how it's almost juvenile now. I mean, you look at it now and you look back at that, such a silly thing. What was he intending to do with these people? Um, but it's fascinating because the operation Northwoods really was suggesting that innocent Americans could be killed. Planes could be hijacked or fake hijacked. Yeah, they faked, they were going to take the passengers and land them somewhere else and switch out airplanes and, and bombings could take place and assassinations all on our soil by our own people blamed on Castro's Cuban communists. And that was in 1962. So if they cook that up, then what makes you think that these same people wouldn't cook up 9-11? Well, really, That's, um, you know, with Operation better. Northwoods, everybody signed off on it. All the chiefs, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff signed off on it. Everybody involved in the CIA signed off on it. The FBI signed off on it. And the only reason it didn't happen is because Kennedy, bless his heart, said, we're not going to do that. Exactly. That's the only reason it didn't happen. As a matter of fact, in the book I was reading, it said that this was not far from the standard operating procedures of the CIA. Now that's Operation uh, Northwoods. And that's basically what 9-11 was just cooked up, kicksied up to uh, for the year 2001. Yeah, I mean, it's just they twisted it up a little bit. That's all. And it was for the same reason to get us in to a war. Now, in 9-11, it was war with these unnamed Muslim countries. But hey, in reality, there were no Muslims on board. Ten of those guys were still alive, at least maybe all of them. Maybe some of them were just make-believe even, not even real humans walking the earth. They just grabbed people's names and identity. Maybe they were already were dead. Well, the point is, it doesn't really matter whether there were Muslims on board. There were over 3,000 people that were killed that yep. day. And so if you could blame it on Muslims or as you like to call it, the nudist Buddhists, <laughs> <laughs> you could then go to war with whomever it was that you could actually pin the blame on. And it was pretty easy to pin the blame on uh, Muslims that particular day. And so because they wanted to go to war in the Middle East and deal with Afghanistan and Iraq, even though there weren't any people from Afghanistan or Iraq on those planes, or even mentioned to be on those planes, uh, that's where they put their uh, impetus uh, to. And that the same thing happened in Havana. I mean, if they had succeeded, if Kennedy hadn't have put a stop to that, we would have invaded Havana and uh, all of Cuba, and that probably would be the 51st state by now. That's possible, quite possible. Well, it's really interesting because looking back on 9-11, the project for a new American century, you can look that up on even just read the Wikipedia on it. But if you just Google search project for a new American century, PNAC, it's often referred to, had written a paper, and I believe they originally wrote the paper in 1999 when Bill Clinton was still the president, kind of. He kind of rejected this whole idea too, but it was basically a call up for a quote, new Pearl Harbor to rally the American people for these coming wars that they had planned in advance. Wesley Clark told us about that. Uh, and we've seen now, 17 years later, we've seen what has, what have we gained? What has the, the country of Iraq gained by us being there for 17 years or if Afghanistan? One thing has happened because another thing that I've uncovered is the CIA doesn't go anywhere and create a war without something coming back to us called drugs. And a lot of people that expose this, Gary Webb, for instance, uh, Kill the Messenger is the movie they did about him. Danny Casolaro, from, uh, he was uh, exposing this as well in that era of the Iran-Contra. And a lot of the same players from the Iran-Contra uh, were uh, still doing stuff prior to 9-11. And so there's a lot of these people that have still been doing this. And I say this now, George Bush, George H.W. Bush passed away yesterday. He would be one of those people. And I know that um, Trump released a bunch of the Kennedy files, but I think there's still some 20 or 30,000 uh, pages or files left to expose. And they weren't going to do it until somebody who was involved... And George H.W. Bush was there. Uh, he, he was there. He was with the CIA. 
uh, the, until that person passed away. Now we'll see if Kennedy, if uh, the Kennedy files get open wide open the rest of the way, because there's some real interesting stuff in there. Uh, while I was writing my fourth book, I would try to split my time up and get in there and read as much as I could, because there were just little nuggets in there that it's like for me now looking at 9-11, I, I laugh at people that are 9-11 truthers that are out there arguing what type of remote control was used. They didn't need a remote control. They had the pilots on the payroll of the CIA. Yeah, they did. Some of the crew members, some of the passengers. There were no 19 Arabs on the real passenger manifest. So once you get that through your head and that veil lifts that you can start to see through the fog, then you start to look at every detail with a whole different set of eyeballs, really, seriously. And when you finish reading that fourth book, you won't look at 9-11 the same anymore. And you probably will no longer say, I can't believe our own government would do that. Well, better believe it, because look at what they've done in Honduras and Guatemala and Iran and all of this history that I tried to bring up without boring people. I tried to make it as present that history to you as interestingly as possible uh, through the um, the guise of a you know, congressional hearing uh, so that you can understand. And then you guys can go and look and look up all these things. You know, Operation Mockingbird is still very much in effect. We can see people now that are definitely CIA, that are handlers for the people like Sean Hannity, who has a handler or two, uh, that are constantly there. Operation Mockingbird is all about delivering information and propaganda to you through Hollywood and through the news, print and TV, to make you think one way or the other about a circumstance, an event such as 9-11, such as TWA 800, Pan Am 103. And they control the message and be, are able to manipulate your forming an opinion. Well, one of the things you did really well in uh, book four in particular with, was with regards to that hearing because those hearings are manipulated to form you know, certain opinions to have happen. And that's really where you, where you went. If you look at the Warren Commission and you look at the 9-11 Commission, the similarities yeah. between those two commissions are unbelievable. The people that they had on those commissions, that you know, whose job it was to uh, steer it in a in a one particular direction. And you mean to, like Lee Hamilton? Well, like Lee <laughs> Hamilton, for example. But you know, I'm thinking a, a lot of them. That uh, you know, Philip John Zekolo and in the, in the in the Kennedy uh, assassination, uh -huh. the original Warren Commission. I mean, John Foster uh, Dulles was on there. You've got to be kidding me. Alan Dulles or Alan Dulles, not John Foster. Alan Dulles, who had been fired by Kennedy. I mean, he was, CIA he was on there because he knew exactly what had happened. I mean, I wouldn't have been surprised if he had a great deal to do with actually, uh, you know, creating the assassination. And his job on the commission was to steer it in, you know, a direction that kept it away from the truth. And the same thing happened with uh, the 9-11 commission. You had people on that committee whose job it was is to, to make sure that we don't ever discuss things like the Solomon building or any of the other uh, aspects of the truth, the 302 reports from the various people that you know, essentially were killed later on. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened with the Kennedy assassination and, the, and the, that there were numbers of people who had uh, eyewitness accounts of things that didn't quite make it to the 20th century, or 21st century. With the Kennedy assassination, one of the things that I found very interesting is that the people that they that really were a threat to the FBI and CIA, to the U.S. government, were people that could connect Lee Harvey Oswald and Jack Ruby, also known as Jack Rubenstein. Now, here's another interesting connection. When Jack Rubenstein, Jack Ruby, we know him as Jack Ruby. His real name was Jack Rubenstein. He was from Chicago. He was kind of a mobster kind of guy. He had a strip club down in Dallas uh, after, you know, be leaving Chicago. Jack Ruby made a comment. I, I don't even recall exactly where I read this. It could be in one of the Kennedy files uh, that he hoped when Kennedy was assassinated that it wouldn't be blamed on the Jews. Well, now, interestingly enough, and I believe this is in the first book, Methodical Illusion, the story of a flight attendant from American Airlines who was a purser, who was called up 
she lived in Miami and based out of Boston. We often commute like that. And she was called up and given flight 11 as a pattern to fly. So she commuted up the night before. And when she got into Boston to her commuter place, sometimes it's a hotel. Sometimes we share an apartment with a bunch of people. Uh, when she got into her commuter place, the crew scheduling called her and said, oh, we've got a, uh, we've got a different person to take that. Uh, flight 11 you don't need to just go home and take a leave of absence she got on a plane early in the morning and headed south to Miami it's about a three-hour flight and uh, maybe you know give or take a little half hour or so and by the time she landed on her home recorder on her telephone recorder we used to all have those then I know everybody's got a cell phone now but at those days you had a telephone recorder that would take a call that you missed and someone would leave a message there was a message left on her, her home recorder because she wasn't there. She was, you know, flying home. And it was a woman's voice with a heavy accent saying, if this had anything to do with uh, the Jews, there'll be hell to pay or something to that effect. I don't know. That's a paraphrasing it. This had anything to do with Israel or the Jews. I just can't remember which one. There'll be hell to pay. Same as Jack Rubenstein, Jack Ruby said he didn't want Israel or the Jews, in his case, to take the blame for the assassination of Kennedy. What kind of flag does that wave for you? Is it blue and white? <laughs> it should be. Uh, but look at what we saw then with the artists that were living in the towers that were Jewish. Look at what we saw with the, when the DEA found out that this traveling ecstasy group that was selling artwork that they uh, found kind of by mistake. And all of the stuff surrounding them, their intention to take down a jumbo jet from Dallas Fort Worth International with a surface to air missile. Um, other, there was another airplane uh, that's, you don't know the official story is totally different than what I'm about to tell you. It left John F. Kennedy. It was an American Airlines. It was November, 2001. And a woman saw two men with a rocket, sh held, a shoulder held rocket is how she described it. She was scared to death to talk to, who would you talk to in the U.S. government? <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I know why I got her story, but I mean, she was afraid to tell anybody because she probably would be dead if she would have. So it's interesting, is it not? Also, another thing, that's, uh, the similarities as um, the people that are involved, like the Timothy McVeigh for Oklahoma City, uh, Mohammed Atta, Lee Harvey Oswald, they all did something else that's very interesting to see is that prior to the event, prior to 9-11, prior to Kennedy's assassination, they had lookalikes that had their ID or the identification of who the government told us later was their uh, uh, alias. Uh, they were traveling around. For example, Muhammad Atta was a million mile passenger. And if you're a frequent flyer and you're listening to this and you've flown 50 or 60,000 miles, you know how much time you're spending in an airplane. And you know that all of us flight attendants know who you are, right? Because uh, we, we'll fly out of the same city you're flying out of when you go to start on your travels. So we all, we know all our frequent flyers and we know our million mile people because there's not very many of them, but he was a million mile passenger. Well, how did that work? Uh, because you accumulate those miles a year before. So in 2001, in September, he was um, a million mile customer for at least a year or two. But according to the government story, he wasn't even here then. He wasn't even in the United States. And when he did travel, he wasn't traveling on American Airlines, uh, according to the government story. But according to his parents, he was an employee of the Israeli Mossad, and he was still alive after 9-11. Both his mother and his father said that. So, and they both had spoken to him after 9-11, after September 12th. So it's interesting that there, there's this pattern. What they do is they uh, create a lookalike, and then they they build what's called a footprint and they will go like for instance Mohammed Atta you know he went to strip clubs with Jack Abramoff a, a Washington DC Jewish lobbyist on his on his a gambling yacht uh, him and uh, I think they claim it was Alamari but Alamari had never been to the United States so but I think that's the government story is it was them but there was a three or four of them well most uh, fundamental Muslims don't drink alcohol and they don't gamble and so we're supposed to believe they're fundamental 
uh, Islamic fundamentalists, but they were breaking all of the rules, including hanging out with pink haired strippers. Uh, this is just not the way it works in the Muslim world. So, but it's, that's the kind of impossibility that we see over and over in these crazy stories, how they can completely ignore something that's going on, like building seven coming down at 520 in the afternoon, like a controlled demolition. They just completely ignore that. We won't talk about that. That didn't happen. You're seeing the same thing currently going on right now in the, in the coup attempt against President Trump. You're seeing the same thing by the same people. This is Robert Mueller. He was the head of the FBI. He's the guy that sealed away the 85 cameras of the, from the Pentagon on 9-11. He was the head of the FBI. He is now supposed to be tasked with, tasked with looking for Russian collusion in the presidential election, but he's not looking at the Clintons and their involvement with Russia and the Uranium One program where they sold 20% of our uranium to the Russians, hundreds of millions of dollars donated uh, to the Clinton Foundation by Russians. The involvement of the Podestas who ran both Bill and Hillary Clinton, the John and, and Tony Podesta in their lobbying firm working mostly for Russians. But during 9-11, he was also responsible for changing the 302s. Now, he maybe didn't do it himself, but he gave the orders to change the 302s to conform with whatever the government story was. And as the government story changed, and it did, Yes. Uh, they changed the evidence to meet that. That's exactly right. And that's why, um, for me, I have boxes of data printed out. I've gone through lots of ink and lots of paper because I realized this. Actually, I had somebody from the CIA tell me this, that they go in and change everything. They change old newspaper articles. They change our changing our history. So you have to print it out so you have it. Um, but that's, that's kind of what's been going on historically. Since they started, uh, and the, the CIA started in the early 50s, so it's been going on my entire lifetime. Uh, you know, I mean, this is just crazy when you look at this stuff. How can anybody with a functioning brain read Operation Northwoods and not see 9-11? Of course, that they were going to plan this just to have a war. I mean, that war with Cuba would have been meh over in an afternoon. But you see, the, and, and here's another thing that's a similarity. MI6 is involved in the a coup attempt against President Trump. That is an ongoing coup, by the way. Robert Mueller's still involved. The Clintons are still out of jail. They're not looking at the involvement of, of anybody associated with Russia and the DNC or the Clintons. And they're refusing to talk to Julian Assange because Julian Assange knows that the Russians weren't involved in releasing the Podesta and Clinton emails. He knows where it came from, came from an inside source in the DNC because they were using an unsecured server for Hillary's state of the secretary of state information and onward and before and afterwards. But they're not looking at that. It's just like they ignored Building 7. Well, they've ignored things about the Kennedy's assassination, both John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. And these people, that they be become their patsies, they pinpoint them, they get a look-alike, they go out, and in Mohammed Atta's case, they he was out drinking vodka and crazy down you know, three nights before, so <laughs> the week before 9-11 in Florida. So the, when the FBI conveniently goes back, but how do they know he was? Of all the places in America that he was in this little uh, margarita bar in Florida, how would the FBI know that? Well, because somebody went and that was working with them and for them and went and pretended they were being Mohammed Atta. And maybe they were Israelis, maybe they were Italians, maybe they were somebody that just sort of looked like him that the CIA put on the task. That's what they do. They go in before the thing and make sure that people see them. This happened to, to uh, Lee, Har Lee Harvey Oswald uh, and people that knew he wasn't at the book depository or knew he wasn't in Mexico City at the time because they, they had proof of it. Uh, they were shunned, ignored, or killed. 
same kind of thing. If you if you saw things, new things for the Kennedy assassination, Robert Kennedy's assassination, Martin Luther King's assassination, Malcolm X assassination, TWA 800, the Oklahoma City bombing. Are we seeing a pattern here? Pan Am 103, the same thing is going on. If you were there, you saw something. If you said something, see something, say something, that's what they want us to do. Boom, you're dead. Or they, I mean, they will ignore you until they kill you, quite frankly. And that's what happens over and over. And there's the pattern I saw. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. <laughs> that's the pattern. And the, so what, one of these things is just like the other. They're all the same. They all are intelligence operations. And so I hope that by sharing uh, that kind of history of the FBI and CIA with you in that fourth book, that you will walk away and go, okay, well, now that last chapter makes total sense to me. And now I understand that the FBI was lying because uh, about the passenger manifest, because originally the FBI said, here's the passenger manifest. Well, the problem they made is they had four people's names on the original passenger manifest they shared with us in the first 72 hours following 9-11. Three of those people were alive and one of them was dead. One of them had been dead in a small airplane crash, coincidentally enough, a year before down in Florida. The other one was an FAA flight instructor. <laughs> They claimed he was one of the hijackers and the other two were, I don't recall what they did for a living, uh, Middle Eastern names. And, and the FBI told you and me that they were on the plane at the helm. They lied. They lied totally because there were no Arabs on board. And once that sinks in, you realize this. But what are we going to do if the world wakes up and realizes that we've been lied to from the get go? And this has gone on since Kennedy. I just laid it out there from the Gulf of Tonkin on <laughs> right down the line. We've been lied to about all this. So how do you explain why are we at war in Afghanistan right now and Iraq? What is that over? Well, it's over heroin. That's why we have an opioid crisis. And then what's going to happen now is they're going to start throwing millions of taxpayer dollars into the opioid crisis, the war on drugs, because it's the CIA who's been bringing the drugs in from the get-go. And that's something else I happened to stumble into uh, while looking into the history of the CIA and talking with people that were contract workers for them. It's been a fascinating study. Uh, and it is kind of frightening. Don't send me an email that says, how come you're not dead yet? Because I probably will be shortly. <laughs> so don't, don't tell me that. It's holiday season. <laughs> don't go there. Um, yeah, well, you know, remember I wrote my books as novels. So if they kill me, you'll know that everything in those novels is true. But I am working on the nonfiction and, um, and another novel in the series. So listen, that is about all I have to say today. Uh, one more reminder, over Chris, between Christmas and New Year's, I won't be doing Saturday shows, but I will be doing a, a deep dive into 9-11 in behind the galley curtain. So if you want to join up, you can come over there and it'll be in place of the daily show. That's where you'll find it. And we'll I'll just number them one through whatever, 10 or something. And I'm not sure how long they'll be, but I'm just going to set up a little series there so that um, we can have uh, time with our families and our grandkids and our kids and uh, all of that stuff. Cause you know how it is on the holidays. So we'll see you over at behind the galley curtain. <laughs>